morning. We're delighted that you've chosen to join us this morning. We are at North Berwick Christian Fellowship and it's great to have you with us. If you don't know us, then please do feel free to check us out on our website. Whether you live locally or further afield, we are just absolutely delighted that you've chosen to spend this morning with us. You can come and like our page on Facebook and also follow us on Instagram. My name is Jo and I'm going to be leading us through the service this morning. If you have any questions or if you just want to let us know that you're watching, please do get in touch and we'd love to connect with you. There are a few different ways that you can connect with NBCF. Maybe this is your first time watching, so let me tell you how you can connect. We are a church family and connection is at the very heart of that. You'd be very welcome to join us on Sundays, either in person or online. And services go out on YouTube at 11 a.m. every week. And don't forget to subscribe and that way you can be kept up to date with future content. You can also sign up for our weekly email NBCF Connect and that goes out on a Saturday morning and that has all the latest news and events in the life of the church in that as well as any important information or updates. We are absolutely thrilled and delighted to announce that on the 31st we are going to be back in to North Berwick High School which is where we normally meet as a church and the plan is going to be to meet weekly from then on out. Obviously with all things right now these are all subject to change if restrictions happen again. This month also represents a really significant anniversary for us as a church. In October 1991, NBCF first started meeting in North Berwick High School and so this is our 30 year anniversary and it's also going to be our first Sunday back in person after a year and a half. Being back in the high school is really significant for us but also celebrating what God has done through this community for 30 years. So we want to invite you to come and join us as we celebrate this amazing milestone to share what God has been doing in our lives. We're going to have people coming and sharing all that God has been doing as well as eating some cake. So Sunday the 31st of October at 10.30am in North Berwick High School is where we're going to be meeting again. If you have attended NBCF before, even as a guest, or have since moved out of the area and you used to be part of the church, and we want to encourage you and invite you to come back and join us for this event, to come and celebrate with us all that God has been doing. You can register for the event on our website for Track and Trace, and you can also help us to spread the word about this amazing event um, by inviting other people. For our online viewers, please rest assured that we will continue to have online services as we return to weekly in-person meetings as well. We are going to be reviewing our format for online services and some changes will be coming, but please do stay posted. Okay, so today we're going to have a short time of worship followed by a talk and Neil is going to be sharing, continuing in on our series on the Emerging Church in Acts. But first of all, let us come and spend a bit of time in worship together just now. We come to worship you this morning, Lord. We come again, still our hearts in your presence. We lift our eyes to you, God. We give you thanks for your faithfulness to us and your great love for us. Psalm 59, verse 16 to 17 from the message says, And me, I'm singing your prowess, shouting at dawn your largess, for you have been a safe place for me, a good place to hide. Strong God, I'm watching you do it. I can always count on you, God, my dependable love. I'm going to read that again. And me, I'm singing your prowess, shouting at dawn your largess, for you have been a safe place for me, a good place to hide. Strong God, I'm watching you do it. I can always count on you, God, my dependable love. And that's who we come to worship this morning, our strong God, who we can always count on, our dependable love. Let's worship. Goodness of God. 
of Jesus, we are given a good news message to share with the world, whether that's through messages like this that come through a church service or simply through the conversations that we have with our friends, family and colleagues. And the message we have hasn't changed in 2000 years, but the way that it is delivered is constantly changing. So how do we convey that good news message of the gospel? Well, today we're going to find out how we can share the message in such a way that it has an impact. So stick around and we're going to explore how that works. So you're joining us today for part three in our series looking at the emerging church. This series has um, had us in the first couple of chapters of Acts of the Apostles looking at the very first church community. How it was birthed and then how it grew and how it began to impact its community. And as a church we find ourselves in a time of emerging as well. We are returning shortly to meeting weekly and our hearts and our minds are turning to the future and how we grow and how we make an impact in our community. So through looking at the early church there are some keys for us to understand. So we looked at the period of preparation before the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, the waiting period if you like, and we looked last week at the coming of the Holy Spirit, the power and how we all need to be filled with the Spirit and come together in unity. This week we look at the response to the Spirit coming at Pentecost. So a crowd has gathered and there's confusion and questions and amazement. Luke says people are amazed and perplexed at the same time. Some are starting to make fun of the disciples and it's into this context that Peter speaks up and delivers the church's first public message. We're going to read the full passage now. It is a long one, but do stick with me and we will make it through. So Acts 2 verse 14. 
Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what we now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord will call. And with many other words he warned them. He pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly look over these verses and help unpack them. And then at the end, I want to give us a few main points. So we have this amazing scene. The, the, the first thing to say that as long as this passage might seem, this was not actually Peter's complete sermon notes. If it was, then he would have set a new record for preachers worldwide, uh, as it would have only been a couple of minutes. There are a number of preaches or speeches in Acts and they capture the key points of the message each time. There was no voice recorder app on uh, people's phones. Uh, rather, Luke gathered the messages from eyewitnesses and perhaps even in speaking to those who gave the, the speeches. So Peter stands up in this moment of confusion and amazement that's turning to mockery. He speaks, but the other 11 stand up with him. The audience? Well, it's fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem. Do follow along in your Bible if you're, if you're tracking with me here. It's Pentecost, which long before it became a Christian celebration, was the festival where the Jews celebrated the giving of the law to Moses, 50 days after Passover. So Jerusalem is in festival mode. Uh, the main audience were Jews, both locally and also those who had traveled for the festival. You know, think of Edinburgh during festival time only less Americans. So Peter begins. He offers to explain what they see and he invites them to listen carefully. You know, it's every preacher's desire to capture attention before we begin. 
He then addresses directly the concern of the onlookers that these 120 are drunk. And much to their astonishment, what they're actually witnessing is the fulfillment of the prophecy by Joel written hundreds of years previously. So this spectacle was drawing a crowd. People speaking in different languages, praising God, is evidence of the Spirit being poured out. So he continues the quotes, you know, sons and daughters will prophesy, young men will see visions and old men will dream, will have dreams. And this quote from Joel is, is one of those future promises that was given to God's people about his pouring out of his spirit. And when we read it, we can get caught up in the language here. It's amazing. The, the phrase pour is used again and again, and it conjures up a picture of abundance. The spirit is not measured out in little containers. It's poured generously and it's given lavishly. And the idea of pouring also shows that this isn't a reversible thing that's going to be undone. What has been poured out can't be put back in the bottle. So the Spirit's arrival is generous and abundant. It overwhelms and it brings great joy. And perhaps that's why they're being accused of being drunk. These men and women are overcome by the Spirit's arrival. And this pouring is for everyone. This is repeated throughout this prophecy. I will pour out my, my Spirit on all people or all flesh, as some translations say. Sons and daughters, old, young, servants, men and women. There's no social class, no gender, no race, no maturity level unaffected by this outpouring of the Spirit. It's available to all in abundance. The outcome of this pouring is prophecy, visions and dreams. In other words, the Spirit's going to reveal God's thoughts, His actions and ideas to His people. It's the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, as Paul says in Ephesians. And the primary sign of the Spirit's pouring is that God's people now both receive and give what God gives them. It's no longer just the special few who hear from God, but all who receive this outpouring. God's Spirit now lives within believers. Verse 19 says, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. This section is using uh, what is common apocalyptic language to reveal that there is going to be a coming judgment. That's what the blood, fire and smoke pictures are all about. This is what's going to happen on, on what it calls the great and glorious day of the Lord, which is a future event tied to Jesus's return. Verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name will be saved. The name of the Lord will be saved. So this is good news. Uh, there will be a future judgment, but the blessings described in this verse are available to everyone. And here the idea of salvation or being saved is mentioned. Uh, the word for saved is sozo, and it carries a much wider meaning. Uh, it means, you know, that God has reached out to everyone to rescue, to restore, and to heal. So salvation is more than fire insurance. It is uh, an invitation to restoration. So reading on verse 22 to 24, Peter outlines the work of Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And this is fascinating when we think about the context. Jesus had walked these very streets just a few weeks previously. He had taught in the temple. He had died not far from here. And the rumors of his missing body would have been all around Jerusalem. So what Peter is saying is historical and verifiable. And it's bold. The people listening probably heard Jesus. They probably were aware of these events that he's describing. There's no way he can make this up. The empty tomb is just down the road and all, all of them are, are people who have encountered something of Jesus's ministry. So this message that Peter brings is deeply historical. Jesus of Nazareth, a real person who you saw and met. He did miracles which you saw. They revealed that he was God and he was handed over to you. It becomes personal. You and, and wicked men put him to death. Yet this is somehow also strangely the plan of God. He died, but God raised him from the dead. And there's an interesting phrase in the midst of this here. It says, freeing him from the agony of death. And this is fascinating because the phrase agony here is to do with birth pains. Here we have a picture of how Jesus dying becomes the catalyst for new birth. New creation is coming. His death was the labor pains that have led to a new creation. This is what the Spirit coming is revealing. 
the start, the breaking in of that new creation. God is making all things new. So having explained Jesus' life, death and resurrection, Peter turns to David, King David, one of the most respected figures for Jews, the one whose lineage would provide the Messiah, which everyone well knew, the rescuer for the Jews. And he, he uses two passages from the Psalms to make the point that even hundreds of years ago, David, through the Spirit, made it clear that the Messiah would not die, that he would be raised. Uh, he was not referring to, uh, to, to Jesus as David had, he wasn't referring to David as David had died and his tomb was still available in that day for people to go and visit. And the contrast here is profound. You know, we've got these two tombs uh, and, and both within walking distance. One is empty and the other is still full. So Jesus has been raised to life and the 12 disciples are all witnesses to this. The Spirit has come because Jesus is now exalted at the right hand of the Father. And with another psalm, he makes the point that Jesus is at the right hand of his Father, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. Peter then states it clearly. Jesus, the one you crucified and killed, is both Lord and Messiah. That is that he is the Jewish Saviour the one they have longed for for thousands of years. And here we get the response of the people. They were cut to the heart. In other words, they they have a moment of realization. It comes together and it makes sense. They are guilty and they have missed the Messiah. Their response, what shall we do? And then Peter gives them really clear instruction. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here we have the simple steps, repent, which literally means to change your mind, to change the way you think, to see reality differently. Be baptized. In other words, make a public act that reveals you've repented internally. A statement that says that you want to align with this new Jesus community and then receive the gift, the Holy Spirit, will be poured out on them just like it has happened for the disciples. And this is the process for everyone, everywhere. And Luke then finishes this section with these final words. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So again, we we have it repeated here by Luke. This wasn't the full message. Peter stays on and he warns and he pleads the crowd. Peter longs for them to step away from the community that has killed Jesus to align themselves with those who now follow Jesus as Lord. And the people who respond then follow Peter's really simple instructions. They repent, they get baptized and presumably receive the Spirit as well. So 3,000 are added to their number. Not a bad day. Uh, And so with Pentecost, the church goes from about 120 to over 3,000. That's 26x growth. Can you imagine the excitement amongst the disciples? Yeah, I suspect they were also kind of looking at each other going, what are we supposed to do now? So having worked our way through the passage, I just want to now just pull out a few key points for us. And this is all about communicating the message. This is the first time the Christian message is articulated by Jesus' disciples, and many hold this up as the best example of how we are to preach and share that message. The challenge of how to communicate the good news of the gospel is something that every generation has had to wrestle with ever since. The foundations, the truth we share, does not change, but the way in which it's delivered must adapt. And we see this throughout Acts itself, Uh, where other characters share the same message, but in different ways. Paul spoke differently to the Gentiles. Stephen speaks differently when he's before the Sanhedrin. Uh, And if I stood out today on North Berwick High Street uh, and gave the same message that Peter gave, I suspect I wouldn't see the same impact. And not only because I'm not the Apostle Peter. So you see, yes, the Spirit is involved in the process of drawing hearts But in what we see here in Peter is a message that's been carefully crafted for the audience that he has in front of him. And as we emerge from this pandemic as a church, there's much we can learn about how 
we articulate the message we carry. In the years to come, we are going to serve and we're going to lo continue to love our community and our actions will speak loudly. But at some point, we must speak and share the message we have clearly. So we are a church. We believe we have good news. But how can we deliver that in such a way that it actually connects? And if we can't figure that piece out, then sadly, good news becomes irrelevant news. So how can we share our message effectively? First point, know the audience. So firstly, Peter knew his audience. They were fellow Jews. Peter had the advantage of knowing his audience really well. He knew what is going to connect with them. He knew that they would listen if he referenced what we call the Old Testament, you know, the Hebrew scriptures. He, he knew if he referenced that, they would connect with it. Jews, particularly in this season of history under Roman occupy, occupation, were awaiting their Messiah to save them. And by explaining from the scriptures how they knew that Jesus was the one they'd been waiting for, he could meet his audience where they were. He was, he was able to basically say, this is that. And this seemingly disturbing and confusing event is this, this thing you are familiar with. He connects the familiar and the unfamiliar. He builds a bridge for people. And he also references King David, someone who was trusted and revered. And by using David's words, he lent himself authority. If you don't trust me, at least trust David. He creates a convincing argument for why Jesus was the promised Jewish Messiah. And I suspect the same message to a non-Jewish audience would have left people a bit confused. So for us, we need to think through about who our audience is when we're sharing. These are just some generalizations, but here um, is the sort of audience that we are perhaps speaking to in our local communities. People who have no experience or understanding of church. People with no understanding of the Bible. People who may identify as spiritual, but certainly not religious. Or perhaps people who think the church is simply irrelevant today. Now there's implications for that uh, we need to think about when we're sharing the message. We can't assume people believe the Bible or even respect it. We can't assume a, even a basic understanding of what God is like. And we have to overcome people's negative perceptions of religion. And we perhaps have to build bridges like Peter does using language and metaphor. To share the message effectively, we must get to know our audience. And that begins with simply listening and understanding and learning from those around us who don't go to church. So when you're having a conversation or trying to share the good news of Jesus, think about knowing your audience. Secondly, answer the questions people are asking. So Peter begins his message by simply responding to a question. The things happening at Pentecost are unusual. They draw a crowd. There is something about this event that raises questions for people. Peter begins by simply answering the question that's being asked. And what an absolutely great way in. Sometimes when it comes to sharing the message of the gospel, we're too busy answering the questions we think people should be asking, that we miss the questions that people are actually asking. And if we want to connect with people, it's important we find out what they are asking and answer those questions. So here's some questions that I suspect most people around us uh, who don't go to church are simply not asking. For example, how does Jesus fulfill the Old Testament prophecies? People are not asking that. They're also not asking, how does God's foreknowledge work in practice? Or, how can I love God more fully? Or, is the Bible authoritative? The sort of questions that people are asking are things like this. How can I be at peace in my life when it's so busy? How do I parent my children? How can I find meaning and purpose for my life? How can I be happy? And how can I manage my money better? So what I'm not saying is that first set of questions are somehow unimportant. I'm just saying that they're not primary 
in most unchurched people's thinking. They make great theology classes for those who want to grow in their knowledge within the church. They just don't invite the thousands into church community. I'm also not saying that the, people, the, the questions people are asking are the most important. I do, however, think that Jesus has lots to say on each of those questions. And if we answer the questions people have, then we open the door to relationship. Would you invite your neighbour to listen to a talk on Old Testament prophecy or how to find peace in your life? Which is an easier thing to invite someone to? And as we look to engage with our community, we might need to embrace change so that we can connect with people who don't go to church, the people that we want to reach with good news. And only answering the questions we as a church find interesting is a sure way for us to stay insider focused. If we want to grow, we will need to reorientate ourselves around connecting with people who don't go to church currently. This is a season for us to look outward. Okay, third thing, how do we share this message? The third one is we must anchor it in the resurrection. So while some aspects of what Peter shares on that first preach need contextualized, another aspect remains absolutely central to our message today. We preach and share a message about Jesus who lived, died, and was raised to life. Whilst we don't have the immediate context of Jerusalem in the weeks after these events, these events still remain primary for us. Christianity stands firmly on the definitive and historical death and resurrection of a Jewish rabbi called Jesus. As important as the New Testament writings are to us, they themselves stand upon that one historical event. No resurrection, no Christianity. Paul puts it like this, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. So just as boldly as Peter on that Pentecost, we stand up and we say, we believe Jesus lived, died and rose again. Not as a metaphor or an image of something else, but as an actual event. There is great historical evidence. And if you want to, I'll happily point you in the direction of some resources around that. So when we get to share the message of good news, the gospel, however we start, whatever questions help us build relationship, we ultimately look for opportunities to share the story of Jesus. We have hope because Jesus rose from the dead. We can be alive because he is alive. And that is why we have any good news to share. So there's a lot in this passage today and I haven't had time to cover all the details that I maybe would have liked to. However, if we as a church community can focus on these three things, then our messages will be more effective. Whether that's the messages from the front like this or whether that is the conversations we have with our friends, family and colleagues. If we can know our audience, if we can answer the questions people are asking and anchor it all in the historical death and resurrection of Jesus, then I think we will do well. In this passage, we see the explosive growth of the church in Jerusalem, a brilliant message that connected with its audience, was inspired by the Spirit and led many to repent, to be baptized and to receive the Spirit for themselves. That is our prayer for NBCF. We want to see God move like that here. And we've learned about recently just about preparing ourselves in prayer. We've learned about receiving God's power through his spirit. And now we're learning about how we convey the message in a way that connects with the people in front of us. As we emerge as a church, we wanna share the message of hope that we have. And that will take preparation, power, and preaching. Next week, we're gonna have our final uh, talk in this series titled Patterns. We hope that you're going to be able to join us. Let me pray for us today. Lord, I thank you for the message of hope that you've given us, that Jesus was a real person, that is a real person who is alive. And thank you that that makes a difference in our lives today. I pray you'd give us opportunities this week to be messengers, to share that message with the people around us. 
And I pray you'd help us to do that by understanding the people that we are connecting with, by uh, being a people who talk about your death and your resurrection, by being a people who answer the questions that are on people's hearts. Uh, And God, I pray that you would use the message that comes from us as a community to transform lives, to see people step into the freedom of Jesus and to see our community know Jesus more. Lord, help us this week, we pray. Amen. Thanks, Neil. Another fantastic message. It's great loads for us to be thinking about as we emerge as an emerging church in this season. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been really great to have you with us. If you want to find out more about who we are and what we get up to, and please do email us or get in touch, uh, social media, email, whatever works best for you. We would just love to connect with you. And please do remember, 31st of October, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. There's loads of information on our website, so please do get in touch and we would just love to see you there. We're going to be back here again next week and we hope to see you then. Take care. Bye.